So here we are in the midst of a conference on the return of the aesthetic in American studies in Frankfurt, Germany at the Goethe University. My name is Nathan Taylor and I'm here with Caroline Levine, who is the Ryan Professor of the Humanities and Professor of English at Cornell University, uh, whose most recent book, 2015, Forms, Whole Rhythm, Hierarchy, and uh, Networks, excuse me, has resonated uh, has made big waves in literary studies in the U.S. and abroad, uh, prompted new discussions about method in the literary studies, and also received numerous awards, including the James Russell Lowell Prize of the MLA. And Caroline Levine has just given a talk here uh, on sustainable aesthetics that we're here to discuss within the broader context of her work. Uh, and so we'll start with that. Caroline, your talk um, aimed, it seemed, to provide a kind of third alternative to what you described as the sort of the, the two options with, in thinking the aesthetics in, in literary studies and outside of literary studies. And that's, on the one hand, to emphasize aesthetics as um, part of aesthetic ideology, on the other hand, uh, to, to emphasize aesthetic autonomy. And you um, are making a claim and making an argument that um, there's a third way to talk about aesthetics, and that would be sustainable aesthetics. And in this claim, you rely more on design than avant-garde art, as you put it. Um, and there's something of a, a political impetus behind this, a kind of gesture that one could call conservative in the best sense, and that is to uh, shift the focus in aesthetics onto forms of sustainability on conservation and conserving as a leftist goal for thinking aesthetics. Perhaps you can tell us uh, first and foremost a bit about what you see to be this intervention uh, with sustainable aesthetics within this, this field of thinking aesthetics. Yeah, sure. So um, it definitely, I feel as though in English departments, especially maybe across the humanities, we've had this really strong tradition of being excited by innovation and disruption and originality, and that's been true for a couple of hundred years. Um, but it's just begun to worry me a lot, especially in recent years, when so much of our lives have been just about or so much of life around us has been about unmaking and undoing. So we've got, you know, Trump unmaking institutions and we've got neoliberal economics taking away job security and we've got fossil fuels producing this kind of climate catastrophe. And so it seems like we live in a world of disruption. Maybe what we really need is a kind of stability. And so I'm trying to think about what kind of art would do that when we've been so focused on art that has been revolutionary and disruptive for us. What, what, what would be this other kind of art? Um, and would it only be art? Or do we need to just think in general about making? And what would a humanity's relationship to making a social world look like? So um, that's where I kind of build on my, on my book on form to think about how we make social worlds. Um, as we make art objects, we also make mm -hmm. social institutions. We also make, we, we design public transportation systems. We make novels. They're all designed objects that make our worlds. Yeah, and design seems to be the key term there, and it's, it's I mean, you know, the, 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 one of the operative and main terms for the book, forms, you borrow from design theory, and that's this, this, this term affordances, um, and affordances, as you describe them, um, are the potential uses or actions latent in material and design. It's a kind of range of capacities, the way we can implement something or put something to use, and I think that this term is interesting, uh, especially because it sort of highlights form as something situated at a nexus between, um, I guess, maybe what one can uneloquently kind of call the givenness of a material or an arrangement, um, what gives a shape to something like a pencil uh, or an arrangement like a hierarchy and allows for it, uh, what those shapes allow for by virtue of that composition. Uh, but also the, the other side of that, which is the, their implementation by, by, by agents, you know, the fact that you could use a pencil to write but also to fish out let's say, a penny from under the refrigerator, right? So, um, in a way, I think the idea of affordances cuts the difference, it seems, between um, shaped things, objects, and subjects, the way that they're used. And in doing so, um, it raises questions of agency, I think, right? Political and otherwise. And I think agency's been, you know, a crucial question of late in the humanities and the social sciences. and. With regards to your work, it seems like one of the main questions that the emphasis on affordances and form has raised is how to understand the agency of forms 
and the agency of those that utilize those forms up to and including the agency of the literary critic that analyzes these forms. Is there, what do you think, what do you see to be the political re re repercussions of, of agency when we use the term affordances? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's such an important question because I feel as though in literary studies we really haven't spent, we haven't resolved the question of agency. We don't know where agency lies, I think. Um, so we have, you know, we, we say certain people or groups have power, right? But how does that power work? Or we say systems or structures have power, or we say individual agents have responsibility or, or, or power. And so to me, it's always been a kind of mystery. And affordances allows me to say, okay, we have a range of, of uh, opportunities to act, but always within a context which circumscribes those, those actions. And so, you know, we can't have a seminar discussion unless we're in an enclosed room because if we're out in the, uh, you know, the traffic, there's honking and we can't hear each other, we can't see each other. And so we need these kind of institutional forms or, or, or uh, spatial or temporal forms to allow us to do, to have, to perform the actions we want to perform. And so it's really thinking about the, you know, the term I'm super interested in recently is infrastructure. What allows us to even have the conversation in the first place? So I think you're right that affordance is a way to say, yeah, we have a certain limited range. We have a certain limited agency, but we can't understand that agency unless we see the ways in which it's circumscribed by the forms that mm -hmm. shape our actions at all. Um, and materials. So, you know, um, we can... I mean, as a question for sustainability, right? We, we Humans cannot do without clean water. And so that's going to be a problem we are going to have to solve, right? Is how to get clean water to all of us. Or conversely, to allow some people to not to, to go without clean water, right? So the, there, there's no going around the question of water, right? We're going to have to deal with that. And so the affordances of um, the very limited capacity that we have to function... Um, is always going to be circ circumscribed by our access mm -hmm. to water. So I, f I do feel like there are these kind of fundamental limits on our agency, um, fundamental necessities that we can't do without. And so agency is always going to be circ circumscribed in that material sense. And it seems like, you know, for you, that's not that's not a bad thing, right? I mean, that that I was thinking of a quote, I think, from Georg Lukács that he writes in a letter where he says that form is also a biological necessity. It's something we need, right? Mm -hmm. So if we think about, you know, the affordances of form is also that which lets us live in a certain way, lets us get by, that institutes our lives, gives us stability and so on, then um, maybe, then, then there are clear political repercussions, right, to thinking sustainability and form together. Um, so what what do you think, how do, how do you see this, the, the politics of this playing out, I guess, is in, in the question would be, you know, if, if there's been such a vehement focus on undoing in literary criticism and literary theory of the last so and so many years, um, you know, you talked about routines, you talked about infrastructures in your talk, um, it, but you emphasize the aesthetic in that context as something that allows us to see artifice in the way that we want to make up the world using forms that afford certain mm -hmm. things. So. Um, what do you think would be the, the political repercussions of thinking the sustainability of forms then as something that we also need to survive? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I do think that the focus on disruption has meant that we, and, 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 our, and, and the longstanding argument that we shouldn't try to imagine a better world because we just can't, right? We're so stuck in our own moment that we can't imagine a better moment. I think that's wrong if you think about form and its affordances because forms all forms do only a certain range of things and they do them predictably no matter where they go. So hierarchy is always going to produce inequality. That's its point, right? That's what it does. Um, so wherever it moves, it produces that social world. And so I think we could participate as humanists in thinking forward, in designing and imagining a world based on forms that could sustain collectives justly and that we are capable of imagining that because we know a lot about how forms work and we know a lot about what they're what what kinds of worlds they afford um so that to me is a political project um and the sustainability part is that you know i'm really interested in the question of which forms actually survive over time and that's something that because we've been focused so focused on disruption we haven't paid attention to but some forms do last and could we design 
forms that help us last and that themselves sustain us over time. And that seems like a totally different project from the one we've been involved in, basically, for the last 40 years. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.